I'm going to take and do a, a continuation of Matt's panel that he did uh, about an hour and a half ago, an hour ago, uh, which was he was talking about some of the steps and processes um, that a, a CEO or a founder needs to be considerate of if they're thinking about taking their company to market. Are you already raising your hand? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I. And uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more from the research side. I'm Dugan Milne, uh, Vice President of Research with the Quorum Group. Um, I love the gaming industry. I'm, I'm very closely involved with the gaming industry, and and I um, I, I kind of constantly got my 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 ear to the wire in terms of what's happening around M&A and, and funding trends with a lot of these companies. Um, so we're going to talk about, I've, I've split this, to be totally honest, I've recycled some of the content from last year, but it was so good uh, that it had to be used again. Um, uh, I've split this into three separate sections. Uh, the first one is perspective. I'm going to tell you some information you already know, uh, but it's just to get our heads in the right frame of mind and then I'm going to take you through a series of, of, of ideas. Uh, the second section is the trends and in investments. Um, I've got a little bit broader trends this year than I did last year, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we're going to also be looking at some of uh, what we're seeing from, from the venture capital industry in terms of investment um, into the gaming space. And then lastly, um, no M&A overview would be complete without an M&A activity report, so we'll be talk talking about that as well. You know, I think if, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions during the actual presentation. All right, we already covered this. If, if you need to get a hold of me on, on LinkedIn or Twitter, there you go. Speaking of Twitter. Um, I've been keeping this, this hashtag casual connect feed open on my desktop for the past few days and on my phone, and I've just been reading a lot of the quotes that have been coming through the conference um, over the past 48, 72 hours, and there's been some really interesting stuff, so I wanted to run through a few of them that I thought were particularly interesting. First one, quote, casual games are the blood pumping through every digital device in the world. Uh, it's, it's smarter to be developing for mobile because there's, there's more mobile users than there are uh, desktop users, mobile is always on. Um, if, if tablets weren't so darn expensive, uh, moms would be buying them and they'd be playing games on them. You also have to be a little bit weary of some of the things you read, hear, and see out there. There's, I, I've, I've been seeing and hearing a lot of statistics coming out of the gaming world that I won't flat out say are, are, are lies or full-on fabricated, but that, that I'm, I'm, I, I'm just not entirely sure of. Um, but hopefully this virtual goods predicted to surpass 20 billion by 2014 is, is perfectly on target. And if so, Google's in the right place because uh, they've just la launched their in-app Android purchases. Uh, we just had Trevor Fencott up here talking about um, the research grants that the Canadian government is giving technology companies. He was also talking a little bit about the shred credits you can get in specific zones uh, throughout Canada um, and some of the other just great tax incentives. At this point, it is now actually cheaper uh, to have a development shop in Canada. It's cheaper to, have, to be developing games in Canada than it is to be developing games in Central Eastern Europe. Um, I thought this one was funny. There's more suits here than I remember. Are people making money with games? And then uh, just a couple of days ago, Dave Roberts, uh, CEO of PopCap, he had his 10 things I hate about casual games, and some guy said, and I bet acquired for 1.3 billion isn't one of them. So let's start through the presentation. Again, these are things we've probably already read before. We've, we've all been watching estimates around the world. Uh, we're, we're, we're expecting about seven billion in 2011 for the sort of social casual mobile space uh, for gaming. Um, roughly one in six people in the world are, are casual game users. And, and I'm sure if we were to poll just downtown Seattle, 
that would be a, a, a far different statistic. Likewise, if we were polling sub-Saharan Africa or something, it'd be very different as well. Um, but still, you see in the light gray there, core or console gaming is, is still a $15 billion market, but we're going to be looking at some of the public companies in this space a little bit later on, and, and many of them are, are bleeding. So some of the demographic things, and again, this has been published in, in, in more ways than one all over the place, um, but women are the, the dominant casual and social game users. Um, under most circumstances. Uh, what they like is simple gameplay. They are consistent players. Um, that's not to say they're playing for several hours at a time, but that they are playing on a daily basis or every other day. Uh, we find that the median age of many of the players is that 35 to 45 year old range. They are mothers or, or part-time job holders. Um, their behavior, they have disposable income, either they themselves have some job bringing in disposable income or husbands or some other form. Um, they're comfortable with web transactions. They're fairly sophisticated people. Uh, solid recurring revenue streams, that's what they are. Uh, they are they're not into piracy, so there's not a lot of worries about that. They generally have no interest in core, <coughs> excuse me, in core gaming. They didn't grow up um, with core gaming in their blood. They don't know how to use an Xbox controller, for example, uh, they don't have fingers uh, permanently crimped in the WASD um, uh, function. Um, they are somewhat low conversion rates. They are price sensitive. The freer, the better. And they are time sensitive. Remember who these people are. They've got a lot of things going on during their day that may involve kids. It may involve any number of, of, of other things. Uh, one of the things that's been very interesting to investors, uh, uh, again, this is things we already know, but I'm just trying to put some perspective here. Uh, the business models that have come out of casual and social uh, in, in the rise over the past, call it, three to five years, have been, have been really tremendous. And we're, uh, frankly, uh, I think we all agree, we're still trying to, to pin it down and figure out what the right business models are. Is it, is it subscription? Is it, is it ad-based? Uh, there's been uh, sponsorship models, microtransactions and in, in-app in payments, uh, various upgrade models, the, the free-to-pay and then, and then gouge them later model, uh, in Asia, I wouldn't have believed it unless I had seen it with my own eyes, but the pay-per-minute model is essentially keep pumping in quarters, uh, except not quarters, it's credit cards. So I want you to start thinking about where your current revenue source is, and I'm going to try and convince you that uh, your future revenue source is probably elsewhere. But um, if we do the, the hand-raising game again, for how many of us are, is North America our dominant revenue source? It's not everyone, but it is a vast majority. Um, chances are, uh, over the next five to ten years, that will shift. And if it doesn't shift within your company, uh, you may sink. So, if we're talking about gaming, of course we need to talk about global G GDP statistics because this stuff is fascinating. But it is kind of interesting. Um, Goldman Sachs has been putting out this index for the past several years. United States, uh, undeniably, um, the, the highest uh, GDP, uh, some 14, uh, 14 trillion or something. Um, and then you see down the list who the, who the dominant players are. There's the, there's the EU5 index, that's the five largest companies in the EU. Japan, China has been catching up uh, rapidly, of course, and then some of the usual suspects, Germany, France, UK, Italy, the rest of the EU rounding that out. Com countries like Brazil making their way up the, up the chain. Uh, so take a, a quick mental snapshot of that. I'm about to flip the page. Voila. So it's, it's supposed, and actually this was their conservative, their conservative estimates, and I use their conservative estimates, and their aggressive estimates show it in 2035 that we're about at this same level. Uh, China being the dominant uh, uh, economy very quickly, almost double that of the United States, still, at which point we will be in second place. Uh, India having climbed the ranks rapidly, 
um, EU5 being knocked down. But even look at the rest of the top 10. It's, it's, it's wild, man. It's, it's uh, Brazil, Russia, it is the BRIC countries, Indonesia, Mexico, uh, UK barely making the top 10, but who else does? It's Turkey. This is a country that has been trying for years to get into, um, into the EU. And uh, frankly, with what they're going through right now, it may be smart for them to let them in. So we're going to go through more statistics here. Internet users in the world, this was uh, captured in, in March of this year. Um, certainly that top line there, Asia at 922 million Internet users. Um, it's a pretty staggering number. North America, 272 million Internet users. So when we think about North American population, that's it's decently close to saturation, okay? That's decently close to full saturation. Um, but let's have a quick look at that. North America, in fact, it is uh, about almost 80% saturation. But we saw just last slide, uh, 922 million. Next slide from Asia. It's, it's, it's less than a quarter of the population has been saturated with, with internet so far. So if you're an investor, okay, just, just put the business cap on. I, I want to invest in internet infrastructure, as an example. Are you going to invest in North America? In the short term, if you do it right, there actually may still be some gains. There's still 20% of the market left here to go. If you're very innovative, for that matter, there may be a lot of market to go. But realistically, if you're an investor, you've got plenty of bucks to spend, you're trying to think about who needs internet infrastructure and where can I make the biggest gains and the biggest impact. I mean, these numbers are staggering. So again, Asia, top internet countries, China, 400, almost half a billion people in China are on the internet today. That's, that's more than the entire population of, of North America. Um, and then that little pie chart off to the right there, it's up from last year. Asia was 41% versus the rest of the world at, at 59. And, and, um, and, and now it's 44% uh, it's of, of the world's internet users are in Asia. Uh, this chart's really too confusing for anyone to understand. Um, what you need to know here, though, is that the red across the bottom is the growth in internet, uh, sorry, excuse me, in, in um, and Asian mobile contracts uh, over the past several years and, and uh, predicted to go into the future up through 2013 is when this one goes. Um, and, and clearly that's a big chunk of those bar charts. And then lastly is the, the penetration rates, <coughs> excuse me, specifically um, <coughs> within Asia. And again, remember we were talking about if I'm an investor, if I'm thinking about where do I want to invest? Is, is my money going to go furthest and have the biggest impact in, say, Singapore, for example? Well, no, not a chance, because this means that uh, the average person has essentially two mobile phones or a mobile phone and a tablet, both of them GSM connected, versus down at this end in China, penetration rates at less than 50% for, for mobile users, India at 30%. Whoop, you weren't supposed to see that. Blew it already, it's okay. Um, does anybody know what major law was enacted in 1978? It took effect in 1979. In 1978 in China. Anybody? One child per family, thank you very much. Um, and that had a significant impact on the population, of course, post-1979, because at that point, something like 50% of families uh, were governed under this law. Um, but that law did not take effect overnight. In fact, the way the Chinese government set it up, they had been telling the Chinese public for years, uh, for, for probably five or seven or 10 years, um, hey, we're gonna be doing this, guys. So just to let you know, uh, in the very near future, you're only going to be able to have one child. So what was the Chinese public's response to that? 
They were breeding. <laughs> they were breeding rapidly. And as you can see in this bracket, right in the middle there, all of this takes place between about 1973 and 1979. So if we go back to what we were talking about with demographics, that stuff that we, of course, already knew, right? Our, 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 our perfect target audience is, is going to be a whole bunch of women, assuming that this is where your game is tailored, uh, is going to be a whole bunch of women roughly 35 to 45 years old. So if, if we have this massive population spike um, where they were born in 1970, 7, 76, 75, how old does that make them? They are right on the cusp of what is going to be a very explosive time. And if, if demographics follow through with what we've seen in, in Western demographics to games versus what we can assume in Eastern demographics to games, um, then we may be entering the, the, the largest consumer period ever. Uh, in, in, in casual and social games. Granted, we may be entering it anyways, but uh, um, this, is a, this is a market that cannot be ignored. Okay, I'm done with the propaganda. We're gonna, we're gonna move on to some trends and investments. And I've got, last year I, I talked about more specific trends and investments. I think I talked about location-based services. There was a lot of investment happening there. Um, it was it was, it was quite a buzz. We were talking about uh, virtual currency I in a big way, and we were also talking about, um, we were talking about augmented reality. And um, that's one that I, I feel like I have not seen much at all in the way of investments in 2011, the first half of 2011, um, let alone even hearing the buzzword as much anymore. It's, it's, it's not quite as prolific. It's not to say it's gone away, but there was a ton of money spent on augmented reality in 2009 and 2010. Not so much in 2011. I'm using bigger topics this time. Um, the first one is online gambling, and this one's, this one's truly significant because this entire space is going through a, 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 just a fundamental change, a, a, a drastic change. There are companies falling off the map left and right who have been in online gambling for quite some time. Um, there are uh, accounts being frozen. In fact, there are, entire, uh, there are entire companies being frozen by government regulators. Um, there are companies that we're talking to um, that tell us, yeah, last month we were doing about 20 million in revenue and this month we'll do about one. And that is because of a lot of these regulations um, that, have, that have been taking place over the past few years. So there's a lot to think about here. Uh, first off, I, I've built a little timeline across the bottom. But going back even further, as an example, uh, Israel in, in 2005 or so uh, completely banned online gambling. And then two years later, they, they said, oh, we've we got to give them something, OK? Let's give them the national sport. And they gave them backgammon. So if you go to Israel, the only online gambling you could do is, is backgammon. How that works, I don't know. By the way, don't ever, ever play backgammon against a native Arab or, or a native Israeli. They're incredible at it. Um, on the opposite side of the spectrum, around that exact same time, Australia had their, their regulatory votes. Um, you see this company down here, Aristocrat Online. Uh, that's an Australian company. As a matter of fact, it's, uh, I believe, the third largest market cap uh, public company in Australia. So when Australia went to look at what they wanted to do about their regulatory activity around online gambling, they had to look at kind of their home turf, and they would say, well, you know, we're not going to take the livelihood out of our, one of our biggest companies. And so Australia is essentially a safe haven for online gambling. Um, uh, but the international gambling committees have said that uh, over the course of the next several years, every major country in the Western world, in particular in the Western world, but, but also including the Eastern world, has to make uh, regulations regarding online gambling. And that is going to make and or break companies. 
that are in this space. Um, there are a lot of existing leaders that have come out of, um, say, out of the casino world in Europe or out of, uh, say, the gambling world in Vegas that have already been doing very well, have been playing very well with the regulatory activities. Um, there's, there's a yin and a yang to, to regulation. One being that, on one side being that if, if your company is, is on the dark side of, of those regulations that get enacted, obviously you're out of business. Uh, on the bright side though, especially for these bigger companies that are already in the space and somewhat controlling of the space, once the lines are drawn, it makes their world so much easier because imagine I don't know what the regulatory activity is or the regulations are here in, 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 in Washington State, but if it's limited to just horse racing, you can only do online betting for horse racing, for example, then IGT or BWIN or some company like this, they don't have to worry about doing marketing to some guy with an IP address in Washington State for poker. They don't have to worry about it for backgammon or, or, or 21 or blackjack or some other sports because they can only do horse racing. It makes their job a lot easier, as a matter of fact. Um, the other big component here is what happens to the land casinos, and, and specifically I'm talking about Vegas, specifically I'm talking about Macaw and, and uh, various parts of Europe. And uh, I've already gotten some some lashing for, for saying this out loud, but I, I, I feel okay about it. Um, if the land casinos do not adopt and adapt to the new form of gambling, which is being done online, Vegas, Macaw, Monaco, these cities will go out of business. They will be shut down, period. Um, they will go the same way as the booksellers. They will go the same way as uh, the music vendors. They will go the same way as, as many of the movie vendors as well. Um, and I know what the arguments are because there were arguments for all those other things. I know what the arguments are for Vegas. Well, it's a destination, and what about Celine Dion? But um, the truth of the matter is they make the bulk of their money. They are in the gambling business. They are in the casino business, and that's where they really make their money. And if that's get, get, that gets pulled away from them from competitive pressures, and they do not embrace that, they will go out of business. My next point is the Western Beachhead. <clears throat> um, somebody asked a great question here earlier, and they asked it to Nat when he was up um, giving his presentation. And unfortunately, I can't remember who it was. But they said, what are you seeing in terms of uh, East coming, was it, was it you? East coming to West, or vice versa even. Um, I'm, I'm calling this the Western Beachhead uh, in, in some sense reminiscent of, of World War I and World War II when the American soldiers would show up on these beaches in northern France or, or Holland or um, Germany. And they had to take these beaches and, and there were these big compounds there of, of Nazi soldiers and they called that the head and they had to take out the head and once they had taken out the head then hypothetically they had the rest of the body was, would, would, would follow. Um, so hence the, hence the beachhead moniker because what we're seeing a lot of these big Asian companies do is they are making acquisitions and investments into very specific, very specific um, Western gaming platforms for a number of reasons. Um, the obvious one is so that let's, let's get this here and then we can start pushing some of our games through it over to uh, the Western folk. Um, but that's, that's not actually quite as obvious as you would think because um, they play different games than we do um, and they have different business models than we do. And what's entertaining over there may not be entertaining over here. Um, so it's also going the other direction, which is let's buy Mochi and let's use Mochi to bring in Western games and try and introduce specific Western games uh, into China or into Japan or Korea. <clears throat> and we'll see which ones work. 
we'll test out different business models and we'll see which ones of those work. Um, so we've got a couple, a few acquisitions here that I think are, are pretty paramount. Uh, Shanda buying Mochi last year, that was about an $80 million acquisition. From there, Shanda put another 10 million into building this platform, then from there put another 10 plus another 10, I believe. Uh, DNA out of, out, of, out of Japan buying NG Moco. NG Moco, I, I knew some of the guys up here, um, NG Moco, but uh, they're, they're based down in Bay Area. Um, but again, same idea, it was a $300 million acquisition. It was a way for, for DNA, which, which is a, a big, a, a, a big Asian gaming and media company uh, to have an inroads to, to the West and to, to better understand the West. And then again with Perfect World, uh, Perfect World and Cryptic Studios, now this one's a little more recent and some may say that, oh no, well, you know, that's two MMO companies, but in fact they did buy, from what I've heard from the Cryptic guys, th it was part of this specific strategy, which was to uh, allow Perfect World to have an, an in. Um, and we've seen Zynga, we've talked about it, uh, Nat talked about it a little bit before as well. <coughs> Zynga bought XPD last year, and then and then just after that, I think they spent some insane amount of money on building a headquarters in Tokyo. My next trend area is analytics, and we're this is. Frankly, this is a, a massive pain point for just about every small studio and publisher out there. Um, I, I'm, to be totally honest, I'm shocked at how many people I talk to who have these excellent titles that are just, uh, I mean, they're just flying up the charts. And when you ask them about, you know, what areas of the game are you leveraging, well, you know, what are where are you guys able to, to monetize? Where, what are you seeing within the game? They have no idea what's going on in that game. They know when it gets purchased. <clears throat> when it gets purchased, excuse me. They know, sometimes they know if it's being played. But for the most part, most of them have no idea to what level people are getting to or what point in the game if there's boss XYZ that they're being challenged and they challenged them four times and they keep losing, if boss XYZ is too difficult, if they're quitting at that point, if they, why they bought the, the purple sword of honor, um, it doesn't make sense how, at what point did they buy the purple sword of honor. Um, and it's, it's amazing to me that, that so many incredible titles are, are, are literally flying off the shelves and um, or out of the app stores, or whatever the case may be, and that the guys who are making it really have no idea what's going on uh, within the game itself. I believe gaming analytics, we're, we're getting to a maturity state in this market. Um, of, course, of course, the big guys already have a lot of, a lot of game, or analytics wrappers for their games. They know what's going on for the most part. Um, but I think there's going to be a, a, a huge opportunity within this industry as it matures over the next, I would call it 24 months, that we start seeing some significant and very robust analytics tools being offered to those studios, those publishers, et cetera. There's a couple of companies in here that are already starting to do something or have announced they're doing things. Uh, game analytics and games analytics. Don't make that mistake twice. Um, the last one's more of a personal plea, and it's the gamification of education. And I've been uh, I've been designing and building this house about 25 minutes from here, um, out in the middle of the woods, and uh, it, it's been a really a painful process, actually. To, Today it was a very painful process because last night the scaffolding fell down on me, uh, a horrible painting accident. Um, but during the time that I've been building this house, I've been staying with my family, and by my family I don't mean my wife and kids, I, I haven't gotten that far yet, but uh, I have been staying with um, renting the cottage on the back of my parents' farm. My youngest sibling is just turned 15, he's my little brother, 
and, and we have a, a decent gap in between us. But uh, it's been fascinating to be interacting with him on a daily basis because we had enough age distance between us that I hadn't before. Um, I hadn't interacted with him as much before. But the difference between h him and his social circles and the way that he views the world versus me 15 years earlier in his same place is, it's, it's almost frightening that things could change that much. And, you know, he's not a, a nerdy or dorky kid. He's got, he's got cool friends, he goes to the right schools, he plays the right sports, so he's, a, he's a genuinely good guy. Um, but the way that they interact today is, is, is mind-boggling to me. Their free time is used at home, on games, all the time. And they're socializing. I mean, uh, we, we can no longer say it's antisocial. It is not, not in any way, shape, or form. He's walking around with a little headset on like this all day long because he's talking to his buddies all day long through some, you know, SIP or VoIP connection through Xbox or whatever platform he happens to be on. My point here is that what I see is that they no longer read. They don't really care about reading. And it's, and it's not just him, and it's not just a function of being a boy at that age. I mean, they literally, none of these guys read or even care about reading because it's almost like they don't have the attention spans for it, or it's not entertaining in the way that so many other things are. And, and the education that they are getting through their schools is so greatly diminished versus what it was, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not some old dog here, but even from, from my time, I, I, I'm watching him and I'm going, there has to be a way, I've heard whispers and I've heard rumors, but I haven't seen it really in stone, there has to be a way to take this phenomenon of gaming, something that they are literally, literally addicted to, um, and living their lives through. Uh, so maybe addiction is the wrong term. Um, but to somehow incorporate that with their, their way of learning. I haven't seen enough information about this. Uh, by the way, if this is a subject that interests you, and I, I hate to call them out, but um, there's a significant figure here in, in at least the Washington State Education Program. He also wrote some of the, uh, the first, uh, he may have been the pioneer in computerized uh, learning, essentially. Uh, Elon Gasper is over here uh, with the white mane behind the, behind the camera. There's this company, Grocket, who apparently Zynga just invested some money in. I'm not sure how much, but it, and I'm not sure if it was sort of like in good faith, uh, a philanthropy type thing, or if it's serious. I don't know, but I think there's a big market there. Okay, shifting gears. Those are my four trend points. We're just gonna, we're gonna run through some charts now, and, and, and I'll wrap this section up. Hmm, I'm way behind schedule. Uh, quarterly VC investment and deal volume trends. Uh, the numbers kind of speak for themselves here. Uh, Q2 and Q1 of 2011, very positive, very positive in terms of venture capital investment that's happening. And this is sort of on a, a, a broad market trend, right? So let's look specifically at the internet space. Internet space, venture capital investment, and deal volume trend. Again, 27, uh, or, uh, I'm not sure if that's 27 billion or... 2.7 billion, and I don't see my, my legend there. Um, I'm going to guess it's 27 billion. Um, in, in Q2 of 11, uh, and these are, these are very healthy numbers, especially when we look back over the past several years, uh, looking at, at, at years like uh, 08 and 09. Um, we've definitely bounced back. But getting even more granular and looking specifically uh, at the gaming industry, um, in this particular chart, I've just broken out Asia, Europe, and the U.S. This is the volume of deals. This is not deal value. But what you see is that clearly, and, and this chart looked, gosh, almost identical last year, um, United States dominates nearly 60% of venture capital investment in the gaming industry is being done uh, for North American companies, uh, specifically U.S. companies. <clears throat> Uh, Europe has shot up quite a bit. I believe last year when I was reporting this, they were at 19%, and Asia has come down quite a bit. 
Uh, last year they were at about 21% uh, uh, or something along those lines. So VC investment by transaction, um, by dollar volume, volume transaction volume, or, uh, value. Um, in the U.S., I don't really believe this number. I, I, you know, it says 600 million in the U.S. But if we look at Zynga at nearly 500, and then we look at several of the others in the first half of 2011, my guess is that even though this is a published number, my guess is that it's well, well over this. Uh, something in the range uh, greater than a billion. The other issue that we're seeing is a lot of, call it undisclosed funding, um, uh, private investors uh, choose to be silent investors who are investing in companies. We've seen it a lot with Zynga. Um, they've been getting uh, uh, money from companies like Google and, and, and Facebook and others. We're seeing it a lot with, um, um, or we saw it with Playdom, um, and I'm trying to think of the other one I, I recently read about. It'll come to me. But as you can see, uh, you know, if we were to take that 500 million out of uh, from, from Zynga out of this equation, then they actually start to get kind of on par with each other between <clears throat> the US, Asia, and Europe. A quick investment case study, and you know, I, I know we're all done hearing about Zynga, but we just got to hear about it for a little bit more. Um, there was actually an initial seed, a seed round, but this is really a, a pretty classic, a classic, this is a, pr a pretty nouveau uh, um, funding strategy, a classic in the sense that we're doing multiple series and then going for an IPO. Um, nouveau in the sense that they, they really, they push something different. They're doing something innovative um, <clears throat> and something that hadn't been done. Uh, this, this, this casual and social gaming, this platform dependency on, on, on a platform that had, uh, frankly, even at the time of launching, was yet unproven, even though Facebook has been a tremendous platform. And then eventually going for the IPO. If you as, as, a, as a founder or CEO are thinking that an IPO is in the cards, the truth of the matter is that we've had a lot of very positive IPOs um, this spring, early summer. HomeAway has done very well. LinkedIn has done very well. <coughs> we don't yet know what's going to happen uh, with casual and social as it hits the public markets because we've yet to see a peer play, casual, social, gaming company hit the public markets, but we're about to. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, IPOs are really challenging. Um, and for the most part, uh, the public markets well, receptive are, are not um, necessarily during them along. And these are some examples. So let's run through some M&A activity. <clears throat> we'll start with public market trends. Um, this is just to show you the volatility that's been happening in the market over the past six, seven months. It's been a very volatile market. Quorum breaks up the software, internet, and IT space into six uh, distinct broad markets. Um, you'll see in the top left, horizontal applications. <coughs> I'm going to lose my voice. Horizontal applications, the, the multiples that we're showing here are enterprise value to sales and enterprise value to EBITDA. These are two very common multiples that are used in the valuation process of, of, of most any technology company but very specific, uh, specifically, uh, they're always used uh, when looking at software, internet, or IT companies. You'll see the uh, horizontal applications one's very high. Uh, I just want to help you understand that the reason we've got um, human resources in there, um, uh, CRM, BI, ERP, uh, some other broad horizontal categories in there. The reason they're, they're doing so well as a group is because there's a heavy concentration of public companies that are using SaaS, software as a service, 
for their business model. And the public markets love that recurring revenue stream. Um, and it's, they've been uh, very, very receptive to it. Consumer applications, not internet, but consumer applications is where we have the gaming space. Uh, the consumer application space in general has done actually quite well. Uh, there's, a, there's a footnote here that's not actually here, which is in November, December, we, we added a bunch of Asian companies, Asian consumer-based companies to the... Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're taking a picture of this, but there's actually, there should be a report right, right next to you there that's got all this stuff as well. Um, we added a bunch of the Asian public, publicly traded companies to this uh, space, which thankfully helped them out a lot. When we look specifically at the gaming sector, we already know who the companies are in this space. EA, THQ, Activision, Blizzard, uh, Giant, Perfect World, etc. In general, the traditional gaming space has been hurting for quite a while. Um, social games are a, a phenomenon that <clears throat> No one can deny it has been, has been fueling uh, kind of the resurgence in, in the gaming space, and we're very excited to see how that plays out in the public space as well. <coughs> I apologize. I, I'm just coming off of this flu that I had last week, and, and obviously it's still, I guess, kind of got a hold of me here, um, at least uh, my throat. Software, IT, and Internet M&A transactions you can see these are deal volumes and deal values uh, by quarter. In general, the first two quarters of 2011 have been extremely productive in M&A. Uh, some of the most productive, the, sir, excuse me, the most productive that we have seen uh, since 2007, 2006 time frame. And when we're looking at public market performance versus tech M&A, in general, they, they they tend to coincide a little bit with each other. Um, there is a little bit of a lag effect. Um, but as you can see, the, the, the public markets have, have not exactly been amazing. You're a great guy. Thank you. Uh, you brought me water here. Uh, the, the public markets have, have, have not exactly been amazing, and we already saw the volatility that's happened over the past several months. Um, but tech M&A has still been very, very strong. Looking at specific spaces, games in general, looking at deal volume, the gaming space has been on fire. It is one of, if not the hottest sector that we track. Um, we see it compared to some of our more traditional spaces, CRM, business intelligence, supply chain management, business process management, or, or even security. Um, and some of these are, are, are reigning leaders over, over the years, but the gaming space in the past 24 months has been just wild. <clears throat> so when we're looking at volumes, again, the United States, uh, as buyers, clearly a dominant force here. In, uh, over the past 12 months, we saw um, 43 gaming acquisitions made by... Um, by, U, by U.S. or North American buyers uh, in that same time frame, uh, Europe with, with 12 and, uh, and Asia with, with 14 as buyers. <clears throat> and then when we break it down and we're looking specifically at sellers, where are the sellers located? Um, again, majority being in the U.S., um, but Europe has been very hot uh, on the, our top left here. Uh, 22 sellers in, in Europe over the past 12 months, um, eight in Asia and, and, and six in Canada, and uh, we probably can't even read these. But uh, and, and I, I included Australia in here because they did have enough deals to, to be looking at. But as we wrap up, uh, who's been top dog in acquisitions? I just took some of the big names. We have had some mid-tier and upcoming players who have been doing a number of acquisitions, which is pretty exciting. Um, but Zynga uh, has just been dominating the scene in terms of acquisitions. EA, total over their history of, of around 20, I think it's a little bit more than that. 
um, five in the past 18 months, seven, er, yeah, 18, 19 months. Um, but you can see down the list here, our traditional companies just not utilizing innovation through acquisition, uh, certainly not in the way that Zynga has. So in closing comments, um, just a few points. Think about <clears throat> where your market is today. And then over the course of the next three, five, ten years, where is that market going to be? Um, and if you're honest with, your, honest with yourself, the, the likely answer is that the bulk majority of your customers are probably not going to be in the U.S. Uh, I, I, I have no doubt that the U.S. will continue to be an, an, an excellent consumer base. I, I just, I truly believe, given the data these days, that uh, other parts of the world will be significant consumer base as well. Gaming M&A is, is on fire right now. Um, if you're going to get involved in it, if you're, if you're looking uh, at a strategic sale of your company, at a strategic exit of some sort, um, don't wait around for it to find you. Uh, be active about it. Be proactive about it. Because um, we're moving at such a breakneck speed in this, in this industry right now that to sit around and wait is, is to your, your, your grave disadvantage. Um, size and size doesn't matter. We're seeing tons of little deals and we're seeing, of course, plenty of huge ones. Um, uh, public performance, the public companies, particularly those, those, uh, those traditional gaming companies as we saw before, not so great, but the private space has been on a tear lately. Um, so we're all in a, in a pretty good field. And our upcoming IPO will give us a much better idea of uh, of where we stand, uh, the casual social gaming space um, in the greater trends of the public markets. That's what I've got for you today. Thank you very much. Any questions, by the way? Excuse me. Yes, please. Uh, Tim Merrill, DigiCapital. Um, we produce a, a quarterly video games investment review globally. And as part of that, we forecast that within three years, um, online and mobile games will be roughly 50% of global revenue at about 44 billion. And of that, 50% China, 17% Europe, 14% Japan, 11% South Korea. Given the restrictions on, say, ownership of games companies in China or the censorship rules in South Korea, how do you think that US companies should target those markets? Was, was the US not in, in your top five list? It's about 10%. Interesting. Within three years' time. Uh, broadly speaking, um, I mean, we believe that their markets are splitting into value and volume globally. And the U.S. is a very large long-term market, but it doesn't have enough people in the volume markets. I mean, you're in agreed. Numbers. I agree. Yeah. I'm, I'm just... So, yeah, it's, it's driven by volume. So what is, what, is, what is or what should be the strategy you're saying? Yeah, how, how do you think the U.S. companies should go into the Asian markets, particularly China, Japan, and South Korea? I think, I think it's challenging. I think th there's very few companies that are attempting to do it right now. I think, um, again, we can, we can keep pointing at Zynga as, as examples, but I think they're one of the few who have done uh, a pretty impressive job of, of setting up their beachhead um, over there. Uh, the XPD acquisition, uh, spending money in both Korea and certainly in, in Japan uh, to set up shops over there, not only to understand those markets, um, and that's kind of the first step is, is understanding they are vastly different business models. They are vastly different gaming models, etc. cetera. Um, I, I think the best approach to, to reaching into those markets is going to be through M&A. That's my simple answer. Yes, please. So do you have any data on um, the um, valuations of how, how the valuations are uh, uh, of, of gaming companies of, of all these deals, yeah. Are these are these mostly based, uh, you know, for capacity, or are the acquisitions happening for IP? Any any data on that front? If I'll tell you what, if actually, if I'll give you my card here in a second, and and I can send you some really interesting valuation information. There's a a number of deals are are just not published uh, in terms of their their value metrics. Um, is particularly the smaller private deals. But there's been plenty of, of deals where metrics have been disclosed, and I'd be happy to show some of those. Just about there. 
Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your time.